Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Six weeks ago, I ripped everything out from what was remaining from my summer crops, improved the soil, and planted all my seedlings. I didn't start anything from seed this year except the spinach, which just is coming on now. But everything in this garden is exploding out of the beds. I attribute that to really awesome soil, lots of compost. That's my thing, you know that. But the garden is looking great. The cabbage is heading up. The mustard is super spicy. The peas are potting. Everything is really great, and I love the fall time of year for a vegetable garden. And a lot of people, I think, overlook that. They think when summer is over, so is the gardening season, and that is so not the truth. It's all about fall today as we document a year in the life of the garden farm at Growing a Greener World. Things started back in March. Now, before I ever put new plants in the ground, I always take time to improve the soil, and the best soil amendment for that is compost and I put my top gardening secret weapon to use. Some people call this livestock panel. I call it a planting grid. And with a pair of bolt cutters, cut it to size for any bed, and then you have the perfect template for spacing out your seedlings. But these things are like Swiss Army knives in that they do more than one job over the course of the growing year. I cut them to smaller sizes to use as trellises for climbers like peas and even bend them into super sturdy cages for my favorite summer crop of all. So I just planted tomatoes, my first ones, yesterday. And I have a few more beds to go. The summer gardening season wasn't without some challenges and surprises, especially with a few of my heirloom tomatoes. But in my case, I've already noticed some problems. And it's called early blight, and it's brown spots on the leaves or along the margins. My tomatoes and I persevered though, with an all organic approach that produced an incredible summer harvest. But we're not done yet, because here on the garden farm, growing vegetables is a year round sport. So if this were a football game, we would be well into the third quarter right now. And looking back on the action so far, it's been a tough game. It's me against mother nature and mother nature is always the predicted winner. Anybody that plays Mother Nature is the underdog, and it's no exception here. But I love the challenge, and right now it's a pretty close game. But it's been the hardest year in the garden that I can remember for a couple reasons. First of all, super, super hot. Atlanta, the southeast area, is always hot and humid, but this year was exceptional. It was always in the mid-90s every day with little rain. Now, that works in a good way and a bad way. If you're growing tomatoes and plants that are very susceptible to disease, that extra moisture can be a problem. And we didn't have that. And that did help my tomato crop. On the other hand, you had to water a lot more. But um, I'm looking around, it's kind of that time where you call a timeout, you clean up, you assess the damage, and you get a game plan to finish it out. And that's what we're doing. But right now we're bringing in the new team, the fresh crop the fall crops, and I'm really looking forward to that. Right now I'm taking out the beans, pulling up the soaker hoses, improving the soil, prepping the beds, and then I'll put something else new in here like spinach or lettuce. Got a lot of things going in, but you know, this is one of those few weekends during the year that there is a lot of intensive work to renew and replenish the beds and get everything sorted out for planting. It's kind of exciting, it's very tiring, but it's just kind of a new chapter and by the end of summer, you're, you're ready for a new chapter. But for many gardeners, there may not be a next chapter at all, and that's by design. Maybe your climate isn't really conducive to winter gardening, it could be that you're personally not interested in continuing the time commitment and maintenance schedule through the colder months, 
or perhaps your family simply doesn't get as excited about cool season crops like beets and kale as they do about summer tomatoes and beans. Whatever the reason, if your vegetable garden isn't a four season endeavor, there's no need to pull out plants that are still performing and producing fruit. In many cases, simply trimming these plants back at the end of the summer will get you beautiful new growth and another late harvest, if you can beat that sometimes unpredictable first frost. But for year rounders like me, it's like a treasure hunt to salvage every last veggie that I can find as the summer crops come out. Still lots of great beans here. So as I pull out, it looks like I've got another job and that's to harvest all the rest of the beans. Can't let those go to waste. So the other frustrating thing about pulling productive plants out of the garden before they're really finished is that you just hate to do that. I mean, they're still working and I'm saying I need the room and you need to go. And I don't know, call me crazy. I just feel a little weird about that. But you have to be ruthless because I need this space. But um, you know, this plant right here, although it's not pretty, a few more weeks I'll have many more red ripe tomatoes, but timing is critical. So it's gonna be fried green tomato time, I guess. Not letting your harvested crops go to waste can be a constant struggle for gardeners but too much edible food is a good problem to have because that means your plants are performing well. And there's always a solution. Try new recipes to use up a bumper crop. Give away veggies to friends, neighbors, and coworkers. Donate surplus to a local food bank or pantry. There's always a way to preserve the harvest. And no one knows more of those ways than our own master food preserver, Teresa Lowe. As gardeners, I think we all have those moments when the entire garden ripens all at once and we don't have time to can it or cook with it. Well, today I'm gonna to show you how to preserve all of your summer flavors and it doesn't take a lot of time and you don't even need any special equipment. I'm talking about using your freezer. And what's great about the freezer is that it preserves the flavor and the nutrition. So we're going to learn some of the tricks and we're gonna start with tomatoes. Now tomatoes happen to be one of the easiest things to freeze, and that's because you literally can just pop it into the freezer. You don't have to peel it or core it. When it defrosts, it comes out kind of as a stewed tomato consistency. It's a little bit soft, and at this point, you can just peel off the skin and you can core it if you need to. And it works in stews and soups and chili, anything where a cooked tomato would be used, but it still has all of that summer fresh picked flavor. There's a couple different ways that you can package up your tomatoes for the freezer. And the easiest is just to use freezer bags and press out as much air as possible. Air is actually the enemy of anything frozen because it kind of deteriorates the flavor and the texture. But if you don't want to have your food next to plastic in the freezer, the best thing to use are your canning jars. Now they have to be modern jars. You don't want to use anything vintage because the glass will break. And you don't want to use like an old mayonnaise jar or sauce jar. It has to be a canning jar because they're tempered glass and they're made to withstand high temperatures and low temperatures. Also, the newer canning jars have an actual mark on them for where you stop when you're filling it for the freezer. And this is because the food expands when it freezes and it needs to have room so that it won't press against the top or break the glass. And I also recommend that you use a jar with straight sides, not the kind that come in at the top. Because this food does expand when it freezes, if it comes in at the top, the food will push on that and can break your jar. Now filling this jar for tomatoes could not be easier. Basically, if it's a small tomato, you just put it in the jar. But if it's a larger tomato like this, you can cut it in half or in quarters, and I just try to squish in as many as I can. They're gonna come out soft anyway, and you want to try and fill the spaces so you don't have any air. So in this case, the jar still has a lot of air pockets. You could actually fill it with water, but I wanna pack as much flavor in here as I can. So I like to use tomato juice. You can actually squeeze a tomato or you can use a canned tomato juice, anything that will fill those voids. When you're filling it with your liquid, make sure you stop at that fill line so that it has room to expand. And then you just put on your lid and your ring 
label this, and use it within six months. Now it's not that it suddenly goes bad at six months, it's just that right at that point you really start losing quality very rapidly. So try to use it within six months for best quality. Now what about berries? Strawberries, blackberries, blueberries? Well berries are also very easy. All you do is place them on a cookie sheet and freeze them for a couple hours first before you put them into the container. And that's so that later, if you just wanna reach in and grab a handful for a smoothie or for your pancake batter, you don't have to defrost the entire container. Also, berries tend to pack in really well and you don't have to add any liquid to eliminate any air. Berries are also wonderful for freezing and later making your jams and jellies. It's a really nice time-saving tip. Well, that brings us to zucchini. And I don't think that there is a gardener alive who hasn't grown too much of this vegetable. All vegetables are normally blanched before they're frozen because they have an enzyme on the outside that can make them get soft and mushy. And blanching just slows down the process. But today, we're looking at ways to save time. And if you're gonna be using this zucchini to make zucchini bread or muffins or put it into a cake to add moisture, then you don't have to blanch it because you don't care if it gets soft and mushy. So what I do when I'm in a hurry is I designate all the zucchini for baked products. And I'll shred it first, and then I'll measure it out in one cup increments. So I pre-grate it measure it in one cup increments because that just happens to be what works for my baked goods. And when it comes out of the freezer, yeah, it's a little bit soft, but it still has all the flavor and nutrition and it adds moisture to anything that you bake with. Now, what if you're growing something that I haven't even shown here? Well, on our website, growingagreenerworld.com, we have recipes, tips, and even videos. Everything you need so that you can preserve your harvest long after the season is over. The end of summer changeover at the garden farm is an ideal time for me to make a trip to my favorite nursery. Brian and Patrick are a couple of industry friends, and their local nursery is my go-to spot for all the best plants and the newest varieties of just about anything I want to include in my fall and winter crop plan. I actually make this visit twice a year, at the beginning of each growing season. While I do grow some of my own plants from seed, and it's certainly gratifying and inexpensive to do so, it can also be pretty labor intensive, especially if you don't have the time to devote to nursing your seeds along for weeks and months ahead of time. A big portion of gardening success comes from deciding which parts of the process you're willing to let go of. And for me, letting Brian and Patrick handle the greenhouse work, leaving me to walk the aisles and choose from their gorgeous plants is a no-brainer of a trade-off. It's been four weeks since the big transition took place, where the bulk of the summer crops came out, the soil was amended, and the cool season crops went in, all over one long, wet weekend. Since then, the weather has been completely dry and temperatures have been mild. As a result, plants have responded well and have taken off. The fall garden is well on its way to a bountiful harvest. Three beds of broccoli, including a stir-fry variety called Artwork, other beds include plenty of curly leaf and dinosaur kale, collard greens, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, cabbage, peas, beets, Swiss chard, and my favorite ornamental edible, giant red mustard. Today, I'll finish up my planting by adding garlic and overplanting with spinach and lettuce seeds. Even though it's getting later in the year, the season has been mild and soil temperatures are still warm enough and ideal for planting lettuce and spinach seeds. The combination works so well since the garlic takes up little horizontal space, and since harvesting won't take place until next summer, the lettuce and spinach will be mostly finished. So it's a great way to get more productivity out of a limited space. So one of the minor annoyances anytime you're growing leafy crops, especially those in the cabbage family, you're likely going to have a caterpillar that's going to consume those leaves. And I'm certainly not immune to that. It's right here all over my garden, but I don't worry about it either because it's a super easy fix. And as an organic gardener, there's a great control for it. We've talked about it before. It's BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a biological control. Basically, you just sprinkle it over the leaves. And then when the caterpillar consumes the leaf and gets a little bit of that in its system, it basically shuts down their digestive system. And within a couple of days, they stop eating. And that's the end of the cabbage worm. 
Now when I buy BT, typically it has some sort of container that has holes in it where you can spread it out. But I like something a little more permanent and this is what you can get at the dollar store. It's basically that jar that you put Parmesan cheese into and you sprinkle. But it's nice and even, it's kind of permanent and it does a nice job. Another thing is, this is collard greens. I'll be eating these leaves, but because BT is safe and it only is harmful to the target pest, I don't have to worry about this harming me. As far as maintenance right now, I continue to add about an inch of homemade compost to all my beds that help build the soil, provide nutrients, and acts as my fall mulch layer. My compost includes a lot of chicken manure and bedding, while the manure and other inputs from my compost add valuable slow-release nitrogen and other important nutrients. But I also like to periodically add fish emulsion as a quick way to get nutrients to the plant. Fall crops are heavy feeders and like a consistent supply of nutrients all through the growing season, yet appreciate an extra boost a few times through the season. The compost and liquid organic fertilizer is the perfect winning combination. In addition to the chicken manure bedding and the kitchen scraps and the yard debris that goes into my compost bin, there's one other secret ingredient that I use all the time, and we've all heard about it, it's coffee grounds. Now this is a fantastic addition to your compost pile too. Now I go by my grocery store about three or four times a week, and right next door, there's my coffee shop. And they've gotten to know me pretty well by now, so they usually have a bag or two waiting for me. And if I go by there three or four times a week, these bags weigh about 15 pounds each, so that's roughly 50 pounds of coffee grounds I'm adding to my compost bin, and that is a lot of contribution. And I'm doing them a favor because I'm helping them eliminate the waste they've got to deal with. I get the coffee grounds from my compost bin, plus we're keeping it out of the landfill, and that's huge. Plus, I take those bags and I recycle them when I go back to the grocery store. So it's a win-win-win all the way around. So you might want to try getting to be good friends with your barista too because they might become your garden's best friend also. Four weeks later, everything has jumped. Uh, the, the plants are responding really well to the soil, lots of compost, some fish emulsion. Recently, that's the only feeding I've done since I've planted. And um, everything looks really good. Temperatures are just now starting to cool off finally. I mean, we've had some relatively warm weather and that could have something to do with the extra growth that we've had with these plants early on. But now uh, we're truly into the fall weather and everything is settling in nicely. The only thing I've done lately is plant some garlic and some spinach seeds and now all the beds are complete. I've put some cattle panel grids over some of these beds, like this one right here that you can see, because I just put some more seeds there and you know, I get the foraging squirrels and even an occasional cat that thinks that's their litter box, which is not cool, but you know, you've gotta have a barrier there to prevent that from happening. So for me, with all these cattle panels I love to use, I just lay that over the top and it's the perfect solution. And then once these plants fill the space, uh, it doesn't seem to be a problem and I just lift those out. And they're not resting right on the soil, they're on the edges, so there's room for everything to germinate without being obstructed by the wire. One of the greatest joys of having a fall vegetable garden, and one of the main selling points if you've never tried it, is just how undemanding it can be. There's not as much germination happening overall in the cooler temperatures, so weeding is minimal. A lot of your usual garden pests are also disappearing with a change in the weather, so all it takes is a little light maintenance to keep everything looking its best. And most cool season crops are ultra forgiving, so there's no real pressure to harvest at just the right time. In fact, once your fall garden is up and running, you may find that all you need to do is go out once a day to see what you want to pick to use for dinner that night. While a livestock panel can keep some critters out of your vegetable beds, it's not a universal solution. And this time of year can bring out a variety of hungry garden visitors. Animals sense the changing weather more acutely than we do. And for many of them, the temperature drop kickstarts their instincts to find more food to prepare them for winter. And for many animals, your fall garden is the perfect place to stock up. Don't be surprised if you find yourself having to add netting over some of your plants or rethink the fencing situation around your entire garden.
Well, it's the day before Thanksgiving, and I have a lot to be thankful for in general, but especially with this garden. So today, and for tomorrow's dinner, this is what I've harvested. Some kale and collards and broccoli and cabbage and peas and beets and mustard and lettuce and spinach. So that's a bounty, and there's a lot more where that came from. So gardening through the fall into early winter is kind of like playing chicken with mother nature. You don't want to flinch too soon and you want to eke out that last harvest. But we all know that mother nature always shows us who's the boss and that's what happened here. I had this beautiful bed of broccoli. Everything had headed up perfectly and I was really looking forward to getting that harvest. But then we had cold weather and it took out the bed, pretty much ruined all those beautiful heads. Two weeks ago, we had 17 degree weather and everything here was fine. And broccoli is one of those crops that can take the cold weather. And frankly, we don't get cold enough here for me to take precautions typically because everything over winter is just fine. But then last week, we got 10 degrees and that's what did it in. Just that seven degree difference in temperature made all the difference in the world and it pretty much wiped out all those beautiful heads. But it's not a total loss because I still have side shoots coming out from after the main harvest and on some of the ones that are even damaged. So I still have the opportunity to take this into the kitchen and enjoy fresh broccoli. So it's not a total loss. Yes, I'm mad at myself and I'm very disappointed that I didn't do more to protect them, but it's okay. And once these plants are finally through, I'll take them and put them into the compost bin as feedstock. And next season, they'll be back out here as compost to replenish these beds and the cycle of life continues and all is well. You know, I like to think of this area as my crash test garden where mistakes are okay and failures are fine as long as you learn from them. Like with my broccoli, at 17 degrees, I knew that was gonna be fine, but at 10 degrees, not so much. Those seven degrees made a huge difference. So I've recorded that in my journal, taking all those notes and it is so important. It may sound like overthinking your hobby when you're, you're recording every little detail, but I can't stress the importance of that, especially the weather, like the temperatures, the highs and the lows of the day, the rainfall, the wind conditions, anything unique, and then where you planted it, what you planted, when you planted it, all of those things make a huge difference when you need to go back and refer to it. And every microclimate is different, even within a zone, like here in zone seven, what may be acceptable in one part of the city for growing may be different right where I live, but you never know that until you grow it yourself. And then write those notes down and being able to refer back to those makes all the difference in the world. I've been doing it for years and it's one of the main things that's made me a better gardener. And I hope you'll start doing the same if you haven't already. I'm Joe Lample. Thanks for joining us everybody for a year in the life of the garden farm. And we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World.